Good evening, LCM. Tonight is Wednesday, January 15th, 2020. The title of tonight's sermon is Elevating Our Trust. Elevating Our Trust. We want to pick up tonight where Justin Treister and Judah Stevens left off on Monday evening. We usually do a little bit of a review as we're getting started, and we're going to do that tonight, but I want to start off on Monday night from Foundations Namely, starting with the idea of clay giants. Somebody say clay giants. Clay giants. See, we're talking about men who may be giants in the faith, but still have clay feet. See, what I know about our church is this. The Lord is calling us. He is granting us to be elevated in His presence. To have an elevated priesthood here at LCM. Somebody say elevate. Elevate. See, he is elevating us, but I know that there's kind of a side effect that some people don't realize. And now that you're getting in the midst of it, you're starting to go, wait a minute. See, I'm beginning to cultivate my heart, but I'm noticing how many rocks are now in my soil. See, I don't like that. I, I like the idea that I thought that I was doing better than I feel like I'm doing today. See, I, with the whole idea of elevating our priesthood, you're noticing more rocks. You're noticing more weeds than you didn't think was there. Let me just give you a little secret. They were there the whole time. This is true. Let's just go ahead and understand the clay feet that we do have. Those rocks were there. You just didn't notice them. See, those weeds were there, but they were choking things out. You just didn't know it. See, a side effect of elevating is you start seeing things that are really, really yucky. You start seeing things that you thought you had long since dealt with, but the Lord is bringing it back to the surface because He wants to help you to be victorious over those things. He wants you to eliminate the rocks. He doesn't want you to walk around being disheartened, being in despair, or being discouraged. He is trying to help you. He's going to help you to be victorious. We have to elevate our perspective in this place tonight. We have to elevate our priesthood, and we have to elevate our trust. Somebody say, Lord, help me elevate my trust. Lord, help me elevate my trust. See, he's going to strengthen us in our trust-grounded obedience to him tonight. In Psalm 112, turn with me to Psalm 112. We're going to take a moment and read this together. Verse 7. Somebody say, there when you are there. There. Psalm 112 in verse 7. It says this. He will have no fear of bad news. Who's the he there? That he is the one who has elevated their trust. The one who is elevating their priesthood. He. They will have no fear of bad news. Anybody get bad news today? Anybody had some bad news lately? Anybody had bad news when you're looking just within yourself? He will have no fear of bad news. He will have no fear that he has rocks in his soul. He will have no fear that there are weeds there. Because his heart is steadfast. Trusting in the Lord. Come on, church, how's your trust doing tonight? The word that came forth in the midst of worship was that the Lord's voice, that His name causes mountains to tremble. He causes darkness to tremble. He's going to cause you to tremble, but you cannot tremble at your circumstances. We only tremble before Him. Your heart is steadfast. You've got to trust in the Lord. His heart is secure. You will have no fear. In the end, somebody say, in the end. In the end. doesn't mean today you can't try to start elevating your priesthood and in three weeks be like, I can't do it. Y'all hear? Y- y'all, you're hearing me. You're a whole month into the idea of elevating your priesthood. Anybody lost heart already? <laughs> we can't. This is the beginning of a lifelong process that's going to allow us to, in the end, look, on, look in triumph on your foes. But it's not going to happen today. So you just got to have a little bit of trust that if you do what's right today and tomorrow and the next day, each today that you are given, that you will in the end look in triumph on your foes. See, God's going to help us to elevate our trust tonight. Man, that's so good. When we're talking about elevating our trust, what we learned on Monday night is that we need to have a single solidarity of conviction. Say that with me. Single Solidarity, solidarity of conviction. Of conviction. See, when you have convictions that are trust grounded in the Lord, it guards you from the schemes of Satan. First Peter chapter one verse thirteen says that we're to prepare our minds for action. See, when the Lord spoke to us on New Year's and told us to elevate our priesthood, church, are you preparing your minds for action? 
No, that's not a good response. I, that's, that was pretty lame. Are you preparing your mind for action? As Pastor Wade mentioned, this is not a three-week stint of elevating our priesthood. This is a lifelong event that we're pursuing again and again and again. When we have convictions, they make you a fixed reference point that others can look to. So when you have convictions, others can look at you and say, because of what he is doing, because of what he is doing, I know where to go. See, we, the Lord has given us pastors and elders who have convictions. That's why we're all here. When you have single solidarity of conviction, it makes you a fixed re reference, reference point for others to look to. It also means that you have convictions now, presently, that echo through the ages. When you have convictions now, when you stand in your convictions now, when you elevate your trust in the Lord now, that echoes through the ages. Amen. So on Monday night, we talked about clay feet. On Monday night, we talked about a single solidarity of our convictions. See, we learned on Monday night that David's not a great man because he was free from sin. David was a great man because he rightly dealt with his sin. Amen. Man, this is something that should be encouraging us today. We've got to move past the concept that success is avoiding all conflict, avoiding all difficulty, and avoiding all consequence. That is not what true success in the kingdom looks like. Rather, success is the unmitigated determination, resolve to have trust, grounded obedience in every area of your life. When you see something from an elevated perspective and you realize that the rocks and the weeds are there, you realize that you have clay feet, what you are supposed to do is respond in trust and say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, that I see another area that I can give trust, granted obedience to you in. We don't hide ourselves in a hole. We stand up and we say, we're going to be great in the kingdom, not because we're free from sin, but because we've learned how to deal with sin. We've learned how to deal with discouragement. We've learned how to deal with the frailty of humanity, and we're trusting in the Lord in every way. This is maturity. Come on, do you want to be mature in this house? The Lord is demanding that we grow up. He's demanding that we look at things from a different perspective than we did before. Come on now, don't get discouraged. God is going to elevate our trust in this house tonight. David's relationship with God was not a transactional relationship or legal. His relationship was personal. In Psalm 51, he said, Against you and you alone have I sinned. So when we're talking about elevating our trust, it means that we have a relationship with the Lord. This is, this is not a, a relationship in a sense where you, you walk in and you pay somebody and they give you something you leave. See, you have a relationship with the Lord where he's your father and you're his son and you're his daughter and he speaks to you. See, David understood that. We must be in touch with the divine. Say that with me. We must be in touch with the divine. See, we must know our father's heart. See, we have to push past the despair. We have to push past our present circumstances and say, I have a relationship with the Father. I'm going to elevate my trust in Him, and I know His heart. And He is cultivating and, re and refining my heart. See, when you have an elevated trust in the Lord, it causes you to have a proper reverence for Him. See, I love what Bim is saying, that we have to know His heart because He clearly knows ours. Let's all turn to Hebrews chapter 12. By the way, we're still just recapping Monday night, by the way. Yeah. If you're missing our Monday nights, you're missing something very, very important for the life blood true. of our church. We want to encourage you to elevate your priesthood by coming on Monday nights and seeing what the Lord is saying. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 4, are you there? Yeah. Verse 4 says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. But Lord, I've done all these things and I've tried as hard as I can. And now the pastors are saying, we've got to elevate and I've got to do more. Yes, you have to do more. Yes, yes absolutely. Why? Because the Lord is speaking to us as pastors and he's demanding it of us personally. I can't tell you how many tears I've shed recently. I can't tell you how much Monday night wrecked my soul in the right kind of way. Me too. There were things that I had to go and talk to my wife and repent about that I knew that the Lord brought up in that moment. Oh, Lord. Yeah, you got to go deal with that. Yes, sir. Elevate. See, in your struggle against sin, you haven't resisted to the point of shedding blood yet. You haven't elevated yourself to the point where we can just relax. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement. 
that addresses you as sons. Here's a word of encouragement for you, church. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when He rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those He loves. God, how wrong is our thinking? We think that if we get disciplined, we have fallen out of the presence of God. We're farther away when He disciplines us. He's actually saying, I'm bringing you close to me when I discipline you. What you're doing is keeping you far away. I want to bring you close. And yet we resist the very thing that will allow us to be close to God. I don't have clay feet. Of course you do. Of course we all do. Because the Lord disciplines those He loves. And He punishes Everyone he accepts as a son. Man, what a beautiful, beautiful picture this is tonight. He accepts everyone he punishes as a son. See, if you're like me, you had loving discipline added to your life on Monday. If you're like me, you are working to not make light of the Lord's discipline and instruction to you. If you're like me, you are taken to heart and not losing heart about the rebukes given. See, if you're like me, you are seeing the incredible love of the Father as He disciplines and works to elevate us. If you're like me, you're realizing that you've been accepted as a son. Let's move on to verse 7. Look at what it says. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline then you are in legitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little, while as they thought best. But God disciplined us for our own good. Say our own good. Our own good. That we might share in his holiness. Look at what verse 11 says. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. See, so the Lord disciplines us for the sole purpose that we might share in His holiness. How extraordinary is that? We read the book of Revelation, and you have the angelic being surrounding the Lord day and night, forever and ever, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's his desire for you. That when he disciplines you, he wants you to partake in his holiness that produces a harvest of righteousness. What is our role in all of this? Look at what verse 12 says. Verse 12 says, Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. LCM, listen to my voice tonight. Part of the word for the Lord, for word of the Lord for us tonight is therefore strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. See, you have to actually trust in the Lord that when you're doing what he's saying, it's going to work out the way that it needs to. And I mean a kind of trust that doesn't just happen today. It doesn't just happen at the start of your obedience. But it's trust, grounded obedience that keeps going on. Lord, I may not see it, but I know that I'm obeying you. Therefore, this must work out. You will make me victorious. Not even death can keep us from being victorious if we have trust, grounded obedience. Church, strengthen your feeble arms. Strengthen those weak knees. Did you hear the word from Pastor Matt during worship? Therefore, stand firm then. Let nothing move you. See, this is what the Lord is encouraging us. God is elevating us tonight. He is strengthening those arms that have been feeble and those knees that have been weak. Golly. See, if we were sitting across the table right now, you know what we would do? I would talk to you about the areas that your arms have been feeble. Tell me what does this mean in your life, Pat? Tell me what does this mean in your life, Spencer? Where have your arms been weak? Don't tell me that your arms haven't been weak because if they'd been strong, we wouldn't be talking about this verse tonight. Yep. Don't tell me that your knees have been completely solid and there's been no area in your life that you haven't been quaking in the knees. Those are the areas that you are not trusting the Lord. You think you are, but you're not trusting Him. We're calling you to elevate that trust tonight. Amen. God is elevating us. He's making level paths for our feet, helping those lame clay feet of the men and women in this room. I got clay feet, everybody. Just want to let you know. Me too. I'm not afraid to say it. I actually want to embrace that so that God may help me and He can strengthen my weak knees. He can strengthen my feeble arms. He can take the lameness out of me. Amen. 
Don't you feel lame when he corrects you? You should feel less lame when he corrects you. He is correcting your lameness. I just, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it work, people. Atlanta, the... God is elevating us. See, a fear says that he's not looking at our lameness. See, when you look at fear, when you look through the eyes of fear, you think that all he's seeing is your lame feet. He's not trying to disqualify you. He's not trying to disable you. What does this passage say? He is healing you. He is helping you. You are being made qualified as you have trust, grounded obedience. He is qualifying you. And yet we feel the opposite, don't we? Oh, I thought I was further along than this. Woe is me. I can't do this. I can't do it. I know he's saying to elevate it, but I can't do it. Maybe somebody else can do it, but I cannot. Shame on you. Don't stay there. He is elevating you. When you see your weaknesses, cry out to him. Yep, there's another area that I got clay feet, Lord. Help me. Strengthen me. And he will. Look at this. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled. You're already lame. Whether you knew it or not, you were already in that state. He's trying to help you so that the lame won't be disabled. You won't be disqualified. My God, if we can get over the fear of being disqualified in this house, I don't mean some other place. I'm not, I hope the people going to watch by online are blessed by this, but I'm talking to you. But pastor, I'm lame. I mean, I just can't do... Stop it. He's talking to us to strengthen our feeble arms, to strengthen our weak knees, to make sure that our lameness that we already have, that we just don't like to talk about, doesn't keep us disabled, but He can heal us from that. Come on now. This is an encouraging word for us tonight. Man, that is so good. The Lord has always been in the business of taking those who are lame and feeble and making them strong. See, the Lord is elevating us. Say that with us. He is, he is elevating ele us. He is elevating us. The Lord is elevating us. One more time. He is elevating us. See, the Lord is elevating us, but now we need to make it personal. The Lord is elevating me. He is elevating me. Come on, church. He is elevating me. He is elevating me. Say it like you mean it. He is elevating me. He is elevating me. See, as we move from these deep, impacting points we just talked about, we want to look at how to elevate our trust in the word. Now, what is the effect of elevating our trust? What is the effect of elevating our trust? When we talk about elevating our priesthood, see, we can kind of get lost in this general knowledge of what we think elevating our priesthood is. The Lord is trying to get us to look at these things practically. When we elevate our trust, it causes an elevated distinction. See, last, Sun last Wednesday, Pastor Wade spoke on Balaam. Did anybody learn anything about Balaam? Did you learn not to renegotiate what the Lord has already said? See, he hinted at this in his last sermon when we talk about that elevated distinction. See, there was a distinction between the donkey and Balaam. See, the donkey saw the angel of the Lord while Balaam didn't. And the Lord made a clear distinction between him and that donkey. There's also a distinction between the nation of Israel and the enemies of God. See, while they are elevating their trust in the Lord as a nation, their enemies are looking for ways to put them out. And the Lord intervenes. See, when we put our trust in the Lord, it causes you to be distinct. While the rest of the world is going to hell in the handbasket and you stand with trust grounded obedience, it causes you to have an elevated distinction. See, it's one thing to have enemies that are external. Somebody say external. External. See, Balaam is, is representing, we, we heard that the Bible shifted perspective and we're looking at Balaam as an external enemy. Outside forces that are working against God's people. But let's, we're going to look at another example out of the book of Numbers. Turn with us to Numbers 16 and we're going to find out that it's more than just external problems that we have to deal with. That there are internal problems that we must master. Numbers chapter 16 and we're going to look at verse 1. Sometimes the external problems are the easy ones, aren't they? At least you see, at least you know who the bad guy is. At least you know who you're supposed to fight. Number 16.1, Korah, uh-oh, son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and certain Reubenites, Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, became insolent. 
Well, <laughs> we're already starting off in a bad place here. See, Korah is a descendant of Levi. He's a descendant of Levi. So, well, well, yes, of course, Pastor, why are you bringing that up? See, I want to remind you about Exodus 32. See, when Moses said, if you're going to be with the Lord, come stand with me. And all of the Levites is what Exodus 32 says. All of the Levites, all of the descendants of Levi came and stood and got their sword out. And they started going through the camp, preferring God's word above all else. Standing with the Lord, elevating their priesthood. And now, Korah, who was one of those men. Who was one of those men. Who had at one point made a right decision to stand with the Lord and be elevated. He has now become insolent. My goodness. This descendant of Levi that's there. Let me, let me help you to understand the word insolent. We have some young folks in the room. I want to make sure that everybody understands what the word insolent means. It means to be proud. It means to be arrogant. To be disrespectful. To be rude. One of the definitions online is insultingly contemptuous. Getting to the point where they forgot that they had clay feet. Saying, no, if I admit that, that can't be right. So I will become insolent and say, no, there is no wrong that I can do. You must be the problem. See, what we're looking at here is that Korah, a descendant of Levi, had become insolent. My gosh, what, a, what an interesting place for us to start our story tonight. How does it make you feel to know that Korah was one of those men who stood in Exodus 32 and sided with the Lord against the entire nation. But where we are now in number 16, he is insolent and he's rebelling against the Lord. Yeah. See, Pastor, that reminds me of a scripture. You guys don't need to turn there. Proverbs 25, 26 says this, like a muddy spring or a polluted well is a righteous man who gives way to the wicked. See, at one point, Korah took righteous action but now he has given way to wickedness because he has uncultivated errors in his own heart. Man, can we learn from this? Can we learn from Korah's rebellion? See, it goes on to say in verse 2 that he rose up against Moses. With them were 250 Israelite men, well-known community leaders who had been appointed members of the council. See, when we do not cultivate our hearts rightly... It not only affects us, but affects those who are following us as well. See, when we don't cultivate our hearts rightly, it ends up dragging us to places that we're not supposed to be. It ends up taking us, place, taking us farther than we ever wanted to go. See, Korah didn't wake up one day and say, you know what? You know what I'd like to do today, Pastor Wade? I would like to rebel against Moses and Aaron. He didn't wake up thinking that. But when you have uncultivated areas in your heart that have gone unchecked for so long, it takes you to places that you never thought you would be. See, Proverbs 10, 17 says this. He who heeds discipline shows the way to life, but whoever ignores correction leads others astray. Goodness. My goodness. Why does, why, why does this hit home so much? God has already spoken to the entire nation in, er, earlier on in Numbers, and he's already apportioned each tribe for what they're supposed to do. Korah has his place within the nation, and he's not, he's not okay with that. He wants more. And look at what it goes on to say in verse 3. Verse 3 says, They came as a group. Somebody say, came as a group. To oppose Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone too far. The whole community is holy. Every one of them. And the Lord is with them. Why then do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly? Man, they came as a group. Man, unholy things tend to get uniting what were once enemies, they become friends. Let's, let's unite around something unholy. I want to remind you the context of what we set up this passage for. If you're still thinking about external enemies, I want you to stop that for just a second. I want you to think about the internal enemies that you deal with. Anybody in the room ever had your emotions and your thoughts come as a group and gang up against you? Yeah. Instead of listening to the actual word of the Lord? They came to put, who do you, you have gone too far now. I know that whole commitment thing is done, but now you've gone too far. Now your kid is sick. See, and you get ganged up on, they come against you in a group. Now, now see, the, 
The circumstances were okay then. Now the circumstances have changed and your emotions begin to group up against you. Your thoughts begin to group with those emotions and come against you and make you afraid. You've gone too far. See, those who once had done the right thing, these 250 men that were along with Korah were known. No, no, no. They're not just known. They're well-known members of the ruling council. These are men who should know better. This is almost like it's at LCM and we should know better than to allow the internal forces to group up against us. See, if you keep it external, then you miss some of the, the beauty of what God has for us in this passage tonight. You have gone too far. By the way, this is exactly what Moses says back to them in a few verses. The issue wasn't that Moses had gone too far. They were projecting what they were doing onto Moses. If you've ever been in leadership, you know what, exactly what that feels like. Someone will accuse you of their very rotten thing that they are doing. Just look at our political system right now. Let's be honest. I don't care where you think on either, both sides of the aisle do this. They accuse each other of what they are guilty of. You can find out what they actually are guilty of. Just listen. They'll start accusing other people of it. I, I, this is, I mean, we're kind of laughing. It's just true. This is what happens. Come on, church. Isn't it easier to believe that everything is actually holy in your life? Isn't that an easier place to be? Let me just put my blinders on. Let me go to a church that's strong. Let me feel really good about myself. Because if you remind me that I have clay feet, I immediately get in despair. I immediately have discouragement settle. Oh, no, just don't tell me that I'm messing up. Tell me that I'm okay. The biggest churches in our country just say, you're okay. You're a champion. Everything is good, guys. Let me encourage you. No, the encouragement is, is that he can bring us and elevate us and cause our lameness to not keep us disabled, but heal us from these things. But you cannot let your emotions, your thoughts, your will gang up against you and cause you to doubt and fear what the Lord has actually instructed you to do. You're no different than being in chorus spot if you allow these things, again, internally, church. We'll deal with the, with the enemies outside. I'll, we'll deal with that later on in this message. We'll deal with that in other messages. Tonight I'm talking about what you're thinking. Tonight I'm talking about where your heart is trusting or having difficulty trusting in the Lord. This is where the Lord has us tonight. Just tell me I'm okay, Pastor. No, I want to elevate you tonight. Ben wants to elevate you tonight. The Lord wants to elevate you tonight. It makes us face the reality that we must elevate our priesthood because we have to elevate our trust. Look at verse 4. When Moses heard this, he fell face down. Say face down. Face down. Then he said to Korah and all his followers, In the morning the Lord will show who belongs to him and who is holy, and he will have that person come near him. The man he chooses will call will, the man he chooses he will cause to come near him. See, Moses' reaction to Korah is Moses falling down. If we're not careful, you think Moses is afraid of Korah, but he's not. Moses is showing reverence for God's name. And he falls straight down and he says, the Lord will show who belongs to him and who is holy. He will have that person come near him. See, holiness causes us to have proximity with the Lord. Hebrews 12 says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And Moses knows that while we're being holy, because the word calls us to be holy, it brings us closer to the Lord. See, holiness requires you to divide from those who are far from the Lord. Man, we just established earlier that we're no longer fo focusing on what is external, but what is eternal. Holiness requires you to divide from those who are far from the Lord. Divide from those thoughts that are far from the Lord. Those feelings that are far from the Lord. Those emotions that are far from the Lord. And elevate our trust in His Word. See, in this story, we're going to find out that a division is coming. Church, anybody realizing in this moment that there are some thoughts that you need to separate yourself from? Some emotions that you need to separate yourself from? Let's skip down to Numbers chapter 16 and verse 25. Numbers 16, 25 says this. Moses got up and went to Dathan and Abiram. See, he wasn't just weeping. He began walking. 
See, he was getting his heart right and began immediately walking. He got up and he went to Dathan. He went to Abiram. And the elders of Israel followed him. See, men who are walking towards God's presence are going to show others the way and they will follow. He warned the assembly, move back from the tents of these wicked men. Somebody say, move back. Move back. Do not touch anything belonging to them. Or you will be swept away because of all of their sins. You could get swept up because of your thoughts, because of your emotions, your own will. Don't get swept away by those things. Move back from those thoughts, church. Those thoughts that demonstrate clearly a lack of trust. If you have said to yourself, I don't think I can do this. That is a moment of having lack of trust. You better move back away from that. You better stay away from that. I'm not sure that I can accomplish this. You better move away from that. You better step back away from that because God has something more for us. He is elevating us. He wants you and is demanding that we elevate our trust. How many times can we say this but not actually do it in our everyday walk? Lord, I trust you. Until it's just difficult at all. Until this one thing happens. And I don't understand why this one thing has happened. The truth is that sometimes it doesn't even take something to happen in your life. You just wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. Thank you for the truthful laughter in the people in this house. You know it wasn't even anything difficult that happened. You're just like, oh, it's Tuesday. I don't think I can do this. whole lot of heads nodding in case you're missing that on the camera there. You better move away from that. Move back from the tents of these wicked men. Don't touch anything. Don't even let the thought stay there. It's almost like the Word instructs us to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Well, my thoughts, if the Lord wanted me to think something different, He would... You've got to take your thought and make it be obedient to Christ. You know what that means? It means your thoughts are disobedient to Christ. It means that your emotions, disobedient to Christ. Well, I'm just so pure-hearted, Pastor, that my, I, I just love Jesus. Come on, man. Yeah, I know. You don't have clay feet. It's just us. Got it. Verse 27. So they moved away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Dathan and Byram had come out and were standing there with their wives, children, and little ones to the entrance of their tent. They were so committed to their wickedness that they came out with all their family with them. Man, what a warning. We have to stay away. We have to move away. Somebody say, move away. Move away. I'm praying that the Lord right now is giving you specific thoughts that you must move away from. Specific areas of discouragement that you've allowed to stay in your heart that you must move away from. Specific thoughts, specific actions that you have that you must move away from. See, I'm not talking about everybody else in the world. I'm talking about you and I'm talking about the stuff that's on the inside of you. Stuff that you can say the right thing to us, but be thinking the wrong thing in your heart. We've got to elevate our trust. See, what Bim read was that when you're the holiness God will show by causing you to come close to the Lord. There's, there's a proximity alert that you've got to be, be paying attention to. You're going to move away from those thoughts. Why? Because you're moving towards the Lord. That holiness of thought, that holiness of mind, brings you towards the Lord and away from the tents of Abiram. Away from the, from the rebellion of Korah. It moves you away from these things. Come on, church, what do you need to move away from tonight? Is it external? Is it internal? It's probably both, isn't it? Don't talk to self. Self is a bad guy. <laughs> Seriously. I'm telling you, church, do not talk to yourself. Some of us find ourselves talking more to ourselves than we do to the Holy Spirit. We need to stop that. In number 16, picking up in verse 31, it says this. As soon as he finished saying all of this, the ground underneath them split apart, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them with their households and all of Korah's men and all their possessions. Verse 33, they went down alive into the grave with everything they owned. The earth closed over them, and they perished 
and were gone from the community. At their cries, all the Israelites around them fled, shouting, The earth is going to swallow us too. Verse 35, And fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. My goodness. See, in 1 Timothy says that some men's sins go before them that are obvious in a place of judgment while others trail behind them. See, Kor rebelled against the Lord, rebelled against the leadership of the nation of Israel, and his judgment was right there in front of him. See, when you take a stand with the Lord like Moses and Aaron did, it causes division. When you take a stand because of the kingdom of God, it causes a holy division. See, for those like Korah, judgment is imminent. But the Lord is calling us to elevate our trust tonight. Amen. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 26. As we begin to shift from just Korah himself, Numbers 26 and verse 11. I just want to read one quick line for you here. Numbers 26, 11 says, The line of Korah, however, did not die out. Wow. Now, you've got, you've got these other men who have their entire families with them. But there's something about Korah and his descendants that changed in this story. There were some that heeded the warning that said, Move away! Move away from them now. Move away from those thoughts. Move away from those feelings. Elevate your trust in this place tonight. There are people who did it. And you know what happens? It says that the line of Korah did not die out. Because they moved away. See, if the Lord is trying to elevate us, and He's telling us to move away from these thoughts that are causing a wicked lack of trust in us, it's because He wants to bring salvation to us. See, from those in the family line that moved away, that elevated their trust towards God, who elevated their zeal in every way possible, they did not die out. They had their trust in the Lord, in the words that God had spoken. See, an elevated trust produces an elevated distinction, which leads to a perpetual priesthood. See, the Lord is aiming us at one spot tonight, church, is to elevate our trust through these things by moving away from those thoughts Let's see what some of the descendants of Korah had to say. Everybody turn to Psalm chapter 46. Say it's about to get good. Say there when you were there. In verse 1, it says, God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Do you guys hear this? These are the sons of Korah. Listen to their song. See, they didn't get around together and say, hey guys, you know it would be a great idea? Let's write, a, let's write a song to the Lord and let's just make stuff up. <laughs> they actually live this. When they say that though the earth give way, they're speaking about real life experiences that they themselves have experienced. Man, this should give special weight to this. See, these this are not some far-off descendants that heard about a story long a long time ago. They were standing with their father, who they likely saw in Exodus 32, take a godly stance for the Lord. And it said, the one thing that we learned from you was to agree with Hashem over you. And now they're writing about it. And they're writing about their experience. Church, do you feel the magnitude of this? We do feel the magnitude when you're in a circumstance, you're in a hardship, you're in a trial, you have thoughts, you have emotions, and you can echo from the bottom of your heart, God is my refuge. He is my help. Therefore, we will not give fear. Church, I am encouraging. We're encouraging tonight. Do not give way to fear. Though the earth give way, though your bank account might be nearing zero. Though the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. These guys lived this. They had a elevated trust in the Lord that produced a trust grounded obedience man do we need to elevate our trust in the Lord tonight yes man their words rung true not only in Psalm 46 but it rings true for the ages to come are you guys being blessed by this yes. are you being blessed by the sons of Korah who took a godly stance who elevated their trust in the Lord and now it is blessing us and the generations to come Man, what does it look like when you elevate your trust in the Lord? 
It blesses the generations that come after you. Come on, let's, let's put verse 1 back on the screen just for a second. God is our refuge and our strength. He is an ever-present help in trouble. Somebody say ever-present. Ever-present. Isn't that part of our lack of trust is in the moment that we're in trouble, we feel like he's not present? Yes, because your feelings, you need to move away from those feelings. Yes. The word says he is an ever-present help. He hasn't forgotten you. He didn't disregard you. It's that he's demanding that we raise and elevate our level of trust so he can show himself as an ever-present help in your time of trouble, whatever that trouble is. Come on, let's look at someone else. Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2. We want to look at another who knew how to stand in an elevated trust kind of way. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 35. Get it, Annie. First one in the church, Annie Clement. Right there, people. You better elevate your finding the scripture. Come on. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 35 says this. I will raise up for myself a faithful priesthood. I love that phrase. This is the Lord speaking. I'm going to do it myself. See, you don't even have to worry about if the Lord can do it. He is saying, I will elevate you. I will raise up for myself a perpetual priesthood. You think you can do it? Yeah, you got clay feet. Don't worry about that. I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to help you to do it. What your part of this is a trust grounded obedience that just never stops. That just never lets up. God himself will raise up for himself. A faithful priesthood who will do what is in, in who will do according to what is in his heart and in his mind see he doesn't have to move away from his thoughts he doesn't have to move away from his emotions because they're always right I will firmly establish his house whose house the house of the faithful perpetual trust grounded elevated in their trust kind of priesthood. He will establish your house. Wow. Isn't that one of the lies that the enemy tries to do is if you really do this, that it's your house that will suffer? It's your children? It's your lineage? Yeah, it's, it's because the enemy is trying to make you afraid where you won't just stay in the fight. See, because he cannot beat you, so if you just keep fighting, you're going to win. If you just keep walking in trust, grounded obedience, you will win. So what does he have to do? He has to be a big bully and make you quit because he truthfully cannot defeat you. He's going to give you another word. He's going to give you another problem. He's going to throw another obstacle just to, in the hopes that you'll just lose heart and quit. A faithful priest, one who is operating in trust, grounded obedience. Ones who have found the way to draw near to Him through holiness. Ones who have moved away from both external and internal enemies. He's going to firmly establish your house. And He will minister before my anointed one always. The result is that you are the kingdom of priests that get to serve before the Messiah always. Somebody say always. Always. See, the idea of a perpetual priesthood runs throughout the Word of God. It runs throughout because He is the one saying, I will do this. Man, you can trust in this. When you are yielding to your feelings, you're, you're not trusting in Him being able to raise up a priesthood for Himself. When you're trusting in your own thoughts, when you're trusting in your perspective of your own circumstances, you have forgotten that he will raise up for himself a perpetual priesthood. Man, what an incredible thought that the Lord has given us. What the Lord did in Samuel's life was incredible. See, being able to minister in front of the Lord always and have an established generation... In 1 Samuel chapter 3, it goes on to say in verse 19, The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of his words fall to the ground. How extraordinary is that? None of his words. How many words have you said today? <laughs> A lot. Too the many. Lord says none, none of his words fall to the ground. It's because he had an elevated trust. See, an elevated trust produced an elevated distinction, which leads to a perpetual elevated priesthood. See, Samuel was somebody who trusted in the Lord. 
He was somebody who the Lord never allowed any of his words to fall to the ground. And the Lord blessed them for it. Let's all turn to Matthew chapter 11 together. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11. See, we've looked at those battles that Korah had. Those internal battles that we talked about tonight through the story of Korah. We've talked about Samuel, who learned how to elevate his trust. And had an, he became the, the leader of a school of men who learned how to elevate their trust and prophesy rightly. Matthew 11, here's another kind of man that we have to look at. I tell you the truth, Matthew 11, 11, Among those born of women... Um, should make you think. Among those born of women. I just love that phrase. Wait, isn't that everybody? Yes, that's the point. <laughs> it's just to bring attention to that very point. Everyone. I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the baptizer. Not been anyone. Man, none greater. Somebody say none greater. None greater. When you think about Isaiah chapter 40, you don't have to turn there. Verse 3, it says, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Isn't that great? He's not even talking about his own words. He's just talking about the voice. Isn't that really what we're all supposed to be doing? Is being but a voice? Being only a voice that speaks what God has said? A voice of one calling in the wilderness. It's his ruach. It's his spirit that breathes through us. It's his power that causes us to move. But we are the voice. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Well, doesn't this sound like Hebrews that we started off our evening with? We're supposed to strengthen our feeble arms. We're supposed to strengthen our weak knees. We're supposed to make level paths for our feet. This is what John the Baptist, this is what he came and ministered as. I just love this verse. I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, okay, got it. There has not risen anyone greater than John the baptizer. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. All right, let, let's not pretend like you've heard this verse a hundred thousand times. Let's, let's, let's put ourselves where we're hearing this for the first time. Kind of an illusion of the first time and you're going, wait, what is he saying? Well, clearly we can be talking about the one who's speaking this here. But there's no one greater except those who are least in the kingdom. See, of course this could be talking about the Messiah, that there has been no one greater except for the Messiah. But what did he do? He elevated his trust because he made himself nothing. He took on the reputation of it. He made himself. He lowered himself. Why? Because he trusted in the Heavenly Father. He trusted in what God was instructing him to do. How about tonight we be encouraged with the thought that those who move away from the chorus, those who elevate their trust, can become something in the kingdom of God. Amen. Can become something special in the kingdom of God that no one else born of a woman can even understand this except for those who are like-minded of elevating their trust, of elevating their priesthood in the kingdom. But that's not all that it says. Look at verse 12. Look at the next verse. It says this, from the days of John the baptizer until now. Somebody say now. Now. Thank you, Even. From the days of John the baptizer until now. Well, clearly this could be about the now that was written when this passage of Scripture was actually written. But let's take it all the way to now. Somebody say now. 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 Like right now. Right now. From the days of John the baptizer until this moment right now that we are all sitting in. The kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. And forceful men lay hold of it. See, you've got to move away from those Korah-like thoughts. Move away from those Korah-like rebellions. Insolent attitudes within your own heart. But you have to do something else. You have to be forceful and advance in it. It's not just enough to leave one thing. You have to forcefully go towards the kingdom. John the Baptist, John the baptizer learned how to elevate his trust, elevate his priesthood by being a forceful man and laying hold of it. See, here's the personal application. Many in this room have left something. We've left other lifestyles. We've left other thoughts. We've left family members. We've left a lot of things. But what are you doing? What's the next step? Pastor, I've left it. 
What's the next step? It's to forcibly advance. It's to elevate your trust and say, I don't know where to go next. This passage of Scripture tells you what to do next. Elevate your trust by stepping forward into what God has for you. Force your way into it. Well, I would, uh, I'd hang out with the pastors more, but uh, they're busy. Force your way into it. I mean, I would press into discipleship, but uh, my job is kind of busy. Force your way into it. Elevate your trust. But, it, but isn't this the problem? You don't force your way in because you're not trusting the Lord. Oh, no, 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 pastor, you don't understand. No, I understand. I understand. It is a lack of trust in our hearts. It's our mind, emotions, it's our will that is fighting against you pressing in the way you should. How many of us in this room came up to a pastor or an elder at the conference in October said, Pastor, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. Have you actually forced your way in or have you just moved away from the things that God has told you to do? This is a cause. This is an action that is resulting from our lack of of trust. See, but the Lord is going to help us because He's giving us from the days of John the Baptist until today, January 15th, 2020, until now. See, the way the kingdom of God has been advancing is that forceful men, violent men, come in and they advance their way into it. They force their way into it. I was having a discussion with my wife the other day. And she was worried about, we were talking and praying about some of you. And I said, hey, I want you to understand. My wife is such an incredible godly woman. She's, she's crying over people in this, in our church. And we want to act rightly before the Lord. And what I know is, I felt encouraged in the moment to say, was there anyone who ever stopped us from getting what we needed to get from the Lord? Was there any set of circumstances that we just would like, well, we didn't have very many people even helping us to do this. Much less a group, a room full of people who care about each other. A room full of people who can show you what it's like to be forceful. We had no one to help us do that. We had people working against us. And it made no difference because we actually love Him. We were going to entrust ourselves to Him. And if we never made anything of ourselves, we were going to trust that as long as we pleased Him, it didn't matter. Come on, church. Are you going to start trusting Him more? Are you going to elevate your trust tonight? Forceful men are going to force their way into it. It doesn't have to be handed to you. You trust in the Lord. You cannot lose. You cannot be broken in this. You just step forward and advance. And violently take hold of what you need in this kingdom. That's how you show that you are trusting in Him above all else. What can stop you? What can defeat you? His name causes darkness to tremble. At the name, at His breath, He can cause the mountains to quake. And He is inside of you. When we finally move past thinking that and actually trusting in that, we're going to be these forceful men who to this day can advance in the kingdom. Do you guys want to be forceful? Yes. See, I'm moved by what Pastor Way just said, and it reminded me of the Gospels in Mark. See, it says that a woman with an issue of blood for 12 years, struggling, no doctor could help her, and she saw Jesus. And it says that Jesus was surrounded with a large crowd, and they were pressing on him pressing on him she saw him she had fears and she elevated her trust over her fears see she didn't just walk up to jesus because the, it, it parted like the red sea she saw that a crowd was pressing against him and she decided that i want to get healed and i know where my healing comes from she pressed through the crowd to receive her healing she elevated her trust above everything else in her circumstance to receive what god had for her are you guys going to be forceful? Are you going to press in? Are you going to look at the crowd and say, I don't care how big the crowd is. I'm going to go straight in. See, it reminds me of Revelation chapter 7. See, we've been talking about 
individuals. When we talk about Korah and Samuel, we're talking about uh, those in, in Matthew 11. In Revelation 7, we're going to talk about a group of people who forced their way in. Look what it says in verse 13. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered him, sir, you know. He said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. See, if we're not careful, we'll think they just walked, they just walked out and just kind of strolled by the great tribulation. How do you come out of a great tribulation? You need to trust in the Lord. You need to trust in his word. You need to elevate your trust in him above everything else. It says that they came out of the great tribulation. They forced their way into the kingdom. And they have made their robes white in the blood of the lamb. Man, do we need our robes to be cleansed in the blood of the lamb tonight? Look at the result of this. Look at the result of being forceful due to having an elevated trust in the Lord. Look at what it says in verse 15. Therefore, say therefore. Therefore. They are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. That forceful attitude, that elevated trust in the Lord caused them to be a perpetual priesthood in the age to come. Serving him day and night in his kingdom. Never again would they hunger. Never again would they thirst. The sun would not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne would be their shepherd. He would lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. Amen. Their trust in the Lord caused them to serve as a priest in the temple of God forever. Amen. Forever, church. What does that look like for you? What does that look like for me? It means that God has set these things in time and in motion for us. He has set these promises for us to be a perpetual priesthood, but we must lay hold of it. We must elevate our trust. We must force our way in, even if it costs us our lives. Yes. See, these people here came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. There was scum of the earth and the world here, and we're elevating the kingdom of God. Amen. Do you want to be elevated tonight, church? Yes. Let's turn to Mark chapter 10. We have two passages of scripture for you, and then we're going to expect us all to respond to what the Lord is doing. Mark chapter 10, start in verse 28. Peter said to him, we have left everything to follow you. We've left it all. But did they just move away from one thing? We know from Matthew eleven twelve 12, they didn't just leave everything, that they forcefully pressed their way into everything that Jesus is. Amen. They left it all behind, yes, but then they pressed in to where God was. It's not just enough for you to leave it behind. See, the elevation in trust says, yes, you've got to leave it all behind and, somebody say and, and press in to where he is. It's not an either or. Look at verse 29. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied. No one. Somebody say no one. No one. This is going to demand that you elevate your trust tonight. Listen to this passage. No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel. Not just that you left it, but you left it because Jesus was calling to you and you responded because of the price of the gospel that you said it's worth it to leave it and for me to forcefully press in. No one. You are not exempt from this process if you have done this process. When you elevate your trust, you can count on what I'm about to read to you. No one will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. I think about my dear friend Eric Stevens. Whole family turning their back on him. And what happens on any day that they are here in town? They have more family here than you could ever hope to have in this world. Amen. hundred times more. hundred times more. 
when you have given up and you've followed and you've pressed in the way you should, there is no one that is exempt from receiving a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters. But, but you don't have money. That's true. But I know I have hundred homes that I could stay in. That's good. I don't have to own them. I have all of the blessing without all the headache, headaches. It's the kind of wealth that doesn't add misery to my life. Talk about tax free. <laughs> Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields. And with them, persecutions. And in the age to come. This present age and in the age to come. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. See, an elevated trust causes us to leave everything and to force our way into what God has. No one avoids is an exception to this rule of God blessing you when you do exactly what the Scripture has said. You are not an exception. You are not an exemption. You just have to elevate your trust so that you may partake in this. How many times do us, do we in this room decide that somehow we are the ones that God's word has, is going to fail on? We, we would never say it out loud that God's word has failed and he's never failed you. But we still have these things where we're like, yeah, but in this situation with my job, I mean, I mean, Marlon is a man of God, but in his job, it may not is the Lord really going to come through for Marlon and Lena? Yeah, He is. Marlon just has to elevate his trust. Cody has to elevate his trust. The Clements have to elevate their trust. Every man and woman in this room has to elevate your trust. See, there's a perpetual priesthood. See, when we talked about Phinehas the other day, he was a single priest. One life. Then we talked about Zadok who produced a family of priests that got to serve in the Lord. And then we ended with Ezra, who helped a whole nation get their hearts right before the Lord. Church, we are on our last scripture as you turn with us to Isaiah 64. But I want you to hear how much the Lord is demanding that we elevate our trust tonight. Isaiah chapter 64, and we're going to start in verse 1. So there when you were there, Verse 1, Oh, that you will rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fires set twigs ablaze and cause water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. See, in Isaiah 64, this is not something that we could just read passively. This should be our heart's cry. This should be from the, 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 well, the wells of our soul crying out to our king that, Father, would you come down? Would you rend the heavens? Would the mountains tremble before you? Would you rend the heavens and come down in our midst? Would you do something that we did not expect? This has to come from a place of elevated trust in his name. This has to come from a place of exalting his name above every other name, exalting his word above every other word, and say, Father, would you do something awesome tonight? Lord, I've been battling my thoughts. I've been wrestling with circumstances. There are trials. There's hardships. But, Father, would you come down? Would you rend the heavens tonight? See, he, he is who was and is to come. In the book of Revelation, who was, who is, and is to come. He was the one who saved you in your past circumstance. He is saving you now, and he will save you to come. Can this be your heart's cry tonight? Look at verse 4. Since ancient times. Pastor, I thought you said earlier, since the times of John the baptizer. Yeah, what we're telling you goes even back further than John the baptizer. Since ancient times, no one has heard. No ear has perceived. No eye has seen any God beside you who acts on behalf of those who wait, who trust, who 
elevate their trust in him. There's no God besides you who acts on the behalf of those who wait for him. My God, church tonight, you should have no fear of bad news. Your heart should be steadfast, trusting in the Lord. If we're going to have a perpetual priesthood, if we're going to elevate, if we're going to cultivate our own hearts, you have to elevate your trust. This is a simple, simple thought that we have for you tonight. I want everybody to stand to your feet quickly and reverently. This is going to be a really, really simple and quick altar call. Do you want to elevate your trust or not? Do you want to move away from those thoughts and feelings that are acting in an insolent manner towards the Lord of all creation? The moment that I begin to pray, this altar becomes a place where you're going to elevate your trust. You may fall to a knee but you're going to be elevating your trust here at this place. You may have to repent, but you're going to be elevating your trust at this altar tonight. Mighty God, I thank you that you have given us the right word tonight. I thank you, Lord, that your word is true. Let every man, let every thought, let every desire that does not in accordance with you be called a liar in this place tonight. Elevate our trust tonight, mighty God. Let us move away from those feelings. Let us move away from those thoughts that are opposing what you are doing in our lives. Help us. Help us to cultivate our hearts now, Lord, that our clay feet will not discourage us, but we will elevate our trust and see that you are trying to strengthen our feeble arms. You are trying to strengthen our weak knees that our lameness, Lord, may not be disabling to us, but that we may be healed in Jesus' name.